Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Uh, I know Jim's uh, running a little bit late this morning, so he'll wander in at some point. Um, or run, whichever. Uh, so uh, we started studying uh, Exodus on, on Tuesday and made good progress through the first uh, seven chapters. So if you want to, we're going to move quickly through that. So if you want to uh, join us um, uh, Tuesday, you're all welcome. If anyone's interested in the evening Bible study or a Zoom Bible study, let me know. Uh, I've got a couple of long announcements about ChristNet, so you can read those at your leisure as far as they're still collecting lots of stuff uh, to get people into, um, into apartments, as it were. And um, I did sign up last week for our church to be responsible for, for providing dinners the, the week of Sunday, March 27th through April 7th. Um, our, uh, so we'll be recruiting some help. Um, Try and get some of the other churches involved that usually were involved with us uh, providing dinners during the February time. Uh, that we usually had Christ met in the building. They are still in a uh, hotel um, in the area rather than in local churches uh, due to the pandemic. So um, that is the situation there. Um, I don't have any other announcements. Um, and with that, uh, I will. Turn it over to Jeff. Oh, I do. I do have one. Here in Sunday, Paul had waved this in front of me last week, but I, I uh, didn't, didn't get it into the pulpit. And this is from Karen. Uh, church fam, I can't thank you enough for your generosity. It is amazing. Um, she's referring, I'm sure, to the Christmas gift. Uh, your friendship means the world to me. Been a rough year for so many. My church family is the greatest. Love, Karen. So thank you, Karen, for all that you do. God has made this day. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship the living God. To God, the living word, the spirit of holiness, be praised from all the earth. We stand as you're able and join in the singing the morning builds the skies, number 185. <laughs>
So neither of these were in the lectionary, but um, as you know, it's my um, habit or custom to, to read through the Bible at least once a year and then immediately start another translation. So last year I read NIV and immediately we started ES. We just finished the New Testament. So now I'm reading through the Old Testament. I thought I would share with you some of these passages um, because I know a lot of you don't kind of stick your nose back that far in the Bible too often. So... <laughs> Which I, which I want to encourage you to do, okay? Uh, so, this is uh, the first three verses of, of, uh, on the, of Numbers 9, or first three verses and the next one. The tabernacle, just a word of explanation, that was the, the, tent, that, the tent of worship that God had told the Israelites to construct for him when they were in the desert before that time came, when they were much settled, settled hundreds of years later, and King Solomon built the temple. So, on the day the tabernacle, the tent, on the day the tabernacle, the tent of the covenant law was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. That is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night, it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Whenever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Now, I think this is the, the one from Numbers 11. It's not from Numbers 9. And this is uh, one of the an incident that happened one of the many times that the Israelites, as a people, complained out in the desert, okay, out in the wilderness where, as you may recall, they wandered for 40 years before God let them come into the promised land. And so, uh, and so this was one of the times. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord, and when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So that place was called Taberah, because fire from the Lord had burned among them. Now, my reading of that text is that it did not burn, burn them, where it burned around them, but in other times where God was upset about their complaining, we have uh, instances of God sending plague, of God sending snakes, um, you're probably, probably more uh, familiar with that one um, because it's in the lectionary, um, but this was a fire um, that was sent. Okay, so I invite you now to probably turn to the screen. Uh, I believe the, the prayer confession is probably on that. If it's not, we'll go to the hymnal, uh, page 892, to, and I invite you to join in a prayer confession. So this is a, uh, uh, a more traditional wording on, on this. That looks like, is that eight, nine, if that's eight, no, nine? No, it's not the right It's now. not, it's not, okay, okay. It's not going to pull up. Okay, we're going, we're going to the panel. Okay. Let us pray. Let us pray. <laughs> Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, who by thy love has made us, and through thy love has kept us, and in thy love wouldst make us perfect, we humbly confess that we have not loved thee with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, and that we have not loved one another as Christ has loved us. Thy life is within our souls, but our selfishness has hindered thee. We have not lived by faith, we have resisted thy spirit. We have neglected thy inspirations. Forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are. And in thy spirit direct what we shall be. That thou mayest come into the full glory of thy creation. In us and in all the people. Through Jesus Christ and the Lord. Amen. I invite you to a time of silence. Thank you. 
the saying is word is sure and further and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the expiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Thanks be to God. Amen. With new uh, lenses in my glasses, I can see all your faces, so this is great. <laughs> Our Old Testament lesson comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, people in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Give us everything. Please remain seated. For uh, I was there to hear your morning cry. It's in the faith we sing, number 2051. Philip, tetrarch of Iturbia, 
and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, Tachart of Adelaide. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. John the Baptist. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We had this scripture, though, in the Advent. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet, Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized him, by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already, laid, is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. And some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, God, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things that he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Here ends the reading from the Gospel according to Luke.
started his public ministry. And like Luke gave us all sorts of historical details, so we know that John the Baptist began his public ministry around A.D. 28-29. So Jesus arrived during that time to be baptized by John. Now in Luke's Gospel, the account of Jesus' baptism is somewhat understated, including it almost seems Jesus' baptism by John is just part of a crowd. But then, as Jesus was praying, presumably after his baptism, Luke says that heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. Of course, it wasn't actually a dove, but some kind of visual event occurred at, of, of which represented or embodied the descent of the Holy Spirit, as well as the audible voice of God, which came down from heaven to say, You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Now, I know that there's probably some of you who've never heard similar words of love or an affirmation from your own father. But thankfully, Jesus did get that internal encouragement and acknowledgement from his dad, God the Father. And soon thereafter, Jesus would be able to cling to that reassurance of his identity as God's special son in his confrontation with the devil during his time in the wilderness in the desert for those 40 days during which he was tempted. Of course, the Holy Spirit would, would um, guide and empower Jesus throughout his ministry as God's son, as the Messiah, the Savior of the world. But as I've mentioned recently, I believe that the Holy Spirit had been with Jesus since his conception or before and didn't wait around until his baptism when he was around the age of 30, as Luke tells us. After all, Luke had already told us uh, in, in previous scripture that an angel had told John the Baptist's parents that John the Baptist would be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. And surely if that was true of John the Baptist, who was the Messiah's forerunner, it would certainly be true of Jesus, the Christ himself, since he was and is the Son of God in the flesh. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus was greeted by John the Baptist saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Matthew tells us that Jesus insisted that being baptized by John was proper to fulfill all righteousness. And most biblical scholars say that Jesus was not baptized to wash away any sins because Scripture asserts that Jesus was without sin. See the book of Hebrews according to that. And rather they, they say, and I agree, that Jesus was baptized in order to identify with us in our humanity, in our sinfulness, and also to provide an example for us to follow. At any rate, well, John the Baptist gave Jesus a warm welcome at the River Jordan. That was definitely not the case for everyone. Well, Matthew's Gospel says that when John the Baptist saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, John called out to them, saying, You brood of vipers who warned you to, come, to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Luke's Gospel records those same words of warning, but records them as being addressed to the crowds, rather than just to the Jewish religious elite. Yet still the people came to be baptized by John. Why? Why would they keep on coming after he had insulted them so? I can imagine uh, many of us, if we heard someone calling us vipers, might be saying, well, I've heard enough from that gentleman, thank you very much, and head out and head back home. But they were responding to the preaching that they had heard John do in the countryside along the Jordan where John had been preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of the sins, of their sins. And now as you very well may know, to repent means to turn away from our sins and to turn back towards God. And John's baptism was to be a visible sign that people had truly done that and in, in their hearts. And in return, God in his mercy would forgive their sins. So it's no wonder that they came to be baptized by John. 
because too often we are very aware of our own sinfulness, and I shouldn't have said too often. Christian baptism means, means all that and more. It should be a sign that we have repented of our sins and wrongdoing and have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Then our being baptized symbolizes God's washing away of our sins, his, his grace and forgiveness being poured out on us to, to cleanse us of our sin. And it also symbolizes or represents a, a, it's an entrance right into the family of God, into the church of Jesus Christ. Yet that's not to be the end of our salvation story, but just the beginning. Just like John the Baptist taught, Jesus also taught that we need to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. That means that our lives should be changed and should show evidence of our faith in Christ through our altered words and actions, our improved behavior, more godly words, and yes, even more godly thoughts. Just like John the Baptist did, the Lord Jesus warned us that our lives must show evidence that our faith is real, or we too can expect judgment in the end. It's not enough to say, well, you know, my parents or my grandparents were Christian, so, yeah, I guess I'm a Christian. I call myself a Christian. No, we, we must actually be one and have a living faith of our own, a faith that, that, that not only believes in Jesus as the Son of God and our Savior, but also a faith that is demonstrated in the works that we do, that, that, that demonstrate that we are truly trying to follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And we're not saved by those works. We're saved by faith. But the works prove that, we are, that our faith is real. And one of the ways that John the Baptist talked about sharing our faith was in, uh, or showing our faith was in the sharing of our possessions and in not abusing power by abusing people financially or otherwise. And that, that was the, the reference that, you know, what, what, do you, what the tax collectors, you know, ask, what should we do? Well, don't collect more taxes. The, the uh, soldiers, well, you know, don't, you know, don't try and get more than your wages where they would have had the power with the military might they had to, to steal and to, uh, to loot and, and rob and, and as well as um, do other things. And those were both messages that, that Jesus would share as Messiah, about, as the Son of God incarnate, as, about sharing of our possessions and not abusing power. But those are messages that we still struggle to obey, don't we? People in our state, even in, our, in this town, I imagine, still go hungry and still may be ill-clothed and, and, and also be abused and slandered and, and legal proceedings in our courts and in our streets and in our schools. It, is, it should not be so and would not be so if, if everyone took God's words more seriously. Nevertheless, John the Baptist's warnings of a coming wrath from God should be considered, ironically, good news on some level because John also challenged people to repent and to prepare their hearts for the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, so that they and we could avoid that very wrath that he spoke about. John the Baptist, John the Baptist um, humbly said to the crowds, or when, when they asked him if he was the Christ, he humbly said, denied repeatedly that he was not, but instead, instead said, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I am the strap will come, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And that, that untying of straps of the sandal would be the work of the servant. And he's saying, I'm not even worthy to be this Messiah's servant. And then he continued to say of this coming Messiah, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, adding his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn the chaff with an unquenchable fire. And friends, John, John wasn't talking about grain, but about people. And John wasn't kidding, and he wasn't wrong about Jesus. While some scholars think that John was talking about 
Jesus' baptism as a single baptism of, 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 of the Holy Spirit and fire. Uh, others with whom I receive two baptisms, one with the Holy Spirit, baptizing, baptizing those who place their faith and trust in Jesus as the Son of God, and a different baptism with fire, where fire is used, quote, as a metaphor of or an instrument of judgment. Basically, many scriptures in the New Testament, the Gospels, talk about how there will be a division between those people who embrace God's purposes and plan of salvation in and through his son Jesus Christ and faith in Christ, and those who do not, those who reject Jesus. And Jesus taught as much in many different parables that he, and in other, in other forms of his teaching. And also the context should, should give us uh, an idea that the fire talked about is, is one of judgment when he talks about burning up wheat and chaff. That's a, a judgment uh, image. And as we saw in our first lesson from Numbers, fire can, can be a physical manifestation or a sign of God's presence like it was in the, in the fire that burned above the tabernacle in the wilderness by night to, to light up and to symbolize, uh, show God's presence or the fire of the, the burning bush which, you know, from which God spoke out uh, to Moses, or even the tongues of fire that descended upon the, uh, which signified the Holy Spirit's descent on the disciples on that first Pentecost day. But fire can also be seen as an instrument of God's judgment, like it was in the Numbers chapter 11, where fire from God broke out in the wilderness in the Israelites' camp, because God was angry with the Israelites about all their complaining. We don't like to think about the coming wrath of God, but we don't need a savior if there's nothing to be saved from. But, honestly, my friends, the same God who spoke to the people of Israel through the prophet <coughs> Isaiah to say to them, do not fear, I have ransomed you, I have summoned you by name, you are mine, I come when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. That God is the same God incarnate in Jesus Christ, who once said, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. Fear him who after your body has been killed has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And if you actually read the Old Testament, you'll see that, that fear is, is, is an appropriate response to some respect to God because he can be a scary God. Elsewhere, in Luke's Gospel, we're told that Jesus called John a prophet, and more than a prophet, calling him my messenger and saying, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. And not only did G Jesus there endorse John the Baptist's credentials as a prophet, and indeed calling him more than a prophet because he was the Messiah's, his forerunner, the voice of one calling in the wilderness, which the passage from Isaiah, which Jesus um, quoted at that point. He also, Jesus himself, also echoed his message, John's message, that the need of the need for us to repent of our sins and turn back to God in order to be spared from the suffering, the holy wrath of our, our just God, who, who is angered by sin and unfortunately will at some point lose patience with sinners so that we need a savior so my friends let us heed both john and jesus's warning and respond to what essentially is their gracious invitation even though it doesn't sound like it may we repent of our sins and our rebellion against god or our casual indifference to him much of the time how often do we even forget to think about God and the, the normal 
person a day. How about if we recommit ourselves to endeavoring to live as God would have us live? And God would have us live with gratitude rather than grumbling against God or about anything, and with generosity, grace, and justice towards other people, demonstrating the same kind of qualities as our God, good God, has in showing mercy and kindness towards others, others who, like ourselves, can fail us, disappoint us, betray us, you name it. And that way we will, and, and on that note, let us consider today just how we might thank and praise God more and grumble less in this new year. And I know that this has been a tough time. We are all so stinking sink, sick of COVID and having to wear masks and trying to keep apart and all the stuff that goes with trying to be conscientious about trying to protect ourselves and others um, and, and having our lives upended to some degree with this. But we still re need to remember to praise God and thank God for, for all that we have and pray for an end to this pandemic. And let us also, also, even in the midst of us, consider just how we might share more. Share more of our time, share more of our resources, and live less focused on our own needs and desires so that we might provide more generously for others, which is one of the pre, supposed to be one of the premier signs of the, of the kingdom of God among us. In that way, and in many others that, in which we can show love for God and for one another, in that way, we will truly celebrate Christ's baptism and remember our own as we continue to on our life's journey of faith in trying to follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior in love and obedience. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the love that you have shown for us in, in reaching out to us with your son, Jesus. 
with the offer of salvation through faith in him and forgiveness of all our sins. We are so grateful, Jesus, for your obedience to your Father's will, your sacrifice and sacrifices on our behalf so that we might know that, know your grace and know your peace. And we pray, Lord, that, that more, if more folks might come to know your son Jesus and experience salvation through him. Help us to share the good news of your son because you love the world so much that you sent him so that anyone and everyone who believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. And so we pray for the conversion of the world and for this, and we lift up especially those names and faces of people we know and love who have so far resisted your your words. Lord, we pray for your spirit to pour you poured out powerfully upon your church in this time. We pray for our, us to be able to share your good news and word and deed. And Lord, we pray for an end to the pandemic and pray for all those who are sick with COVID, especially those who are struggling for their lives. But we pray for all those who are ill. We lift up, um, we lift up Tim's sister, Freddie, and her husband, Jim, and, and um, Jerry's daughter-in-law uh, and son, and all those who are ill. And we lift up, Lord, all of our healthcare workers, those doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and all those who are working in hospitals and feeling uh, and clinics and feeling so overwhelmed. Lord, give them your strength. Give them your courage. Sustain them in their weariness of mind and body. Protect them, Lord. Surround them with your with surround them with your spirit. May they be conduits of your love and your healing. And when that is not possible, Lord, help them when they grieve, and us as well. And Lord, we pray for all those who are in need of healing, and we lift up Caroline in the hospital, and Dorothy in, in, in assisted living, and all those on our list, on our prayer list, who are in need of your healing. And for some, that healing might be life eternal with you. Because at some point, these earthly bodies will fail. And then we will look to you as our Heavenly Father to bring us home to be with you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon this church, this body of Christ, that you might bless us and empower us and guide us in this new year. We also pray for that same guidance and wisdom and power to be with all the leaders of the nations, that you might guide them in your paths of righteousness and justice and peace. For we do so desperately need good, de good leadership in these troubled times, so that war can be avoided, so that, that more of the world's resources including vaccines, can be more equitably distributed. There are so, way, so many ways in which we fail to, to embody the kingdom as you would have us do in this time and place on earth while we wait for, the, for Christ to come and bring the fullness of your kingdom in. And with that in mind, we pray now with the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, our kingdom, Lord, kingdom come. Wait, our Father, who <laughs> art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At some point, we will go back to passing the offering plates. Uh, this Sunday is not that time. <laughs> just as a reminder that the offering plates are in the back. But uh, just an offering for you prayer.
Receive, O Lord, our offerings, which we render for the service of your church and for the extension of your kingdom. Accept them in our hearts and our lives, which we consecrate to you. Nine. 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 Okay. So. May God 